welcome and thank you for spending your time with us today. I want to ask you, have you had the need to complain in the last while? You know, just something went wrong and you had to say something about it. I don't know what it's about. Maybe the clothes you bought, the shoes that didn't fit right. You bought one number seven and one number number nine because those things happen more often than we'd like to admit. Uh, Maybe it was something at school, a parent, a child, maybe a teacher that gave you a hard time and you just felt the urge, the need to complain because we need to do that, don't we? Now, I have a few friends that'll greet you with, Welcome, welcome. How are you doing? Well, it doesn't help to complain. And I hear them, but man, we do feel like we need to complain at times, don't we? Now, we can, let's be honest, complain about everything. Um, My favorite complaints are those that we get on travel blogs. You know, people that get to travel the, the world and moan about it. So some of my favorites are these. On my holiday to India, I was disgusted to find that almost every restaurant served curry. And I don't like spicy food at all. The next one is, as a guest at an Australian restaurant had complained that his soup was way too thick. Turns out he was inadvertently sipping on the gravy. A woman at an American theme park complained that the sun was just too hot. In fact, it was so hot that her ice cream melted in her hand. An air traveler once voiced her disapproval of all the clouds in the sky, saying that they just ruined her children's game of I Spy all the time. Now, as you can clearly see, some complaints does need mentioning. And about the others, we should maybe keep quiet. But reading through the Bible, I stumbled upon and kind of got caught up in the book of Lamentations quite recently. Now, my translation of the word Lamentations is literally moaning and complaining. And so it struck me as odd. It's not like the first time I read it, but it really struck me as odd in this in the Bible, in the book that we turn to for inspiration and hope, that there's an entire book dedicated to moaning and complaining. And so I realized that maybe I need to dig quite deep under the surface to figure out what exactly is going on here. So, doesn't matter what I did, Lamentations stayed a tough read. When you go through Lamentations, you meet Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah, to start off with, is known as the weeping prophet, which really doesn't help the whole story, does it? Now, Jeremiah complains, but he actually mourns the devastation, the absolute uh, destruction of his beloved Jerusalem. You see, the city was under siege uh, for almost a year. During this time, the king decided that he needs to escape. In trying to escape, the king got caught and the king got killed. Then the siege continued as the people could hold out for only a little while, but eventually, overcome by hunger, they gave up. And when they gave up, the city was razed to the ground, temple and all. Not a symbol of hope was left. Jeremiah complains to God. He says, God, you, in your anger, you have cast a shadow over the fairest of the cities of Israel. He says that at the mention of the word Jerusalem, people break into mourning and tears. And Jerusalem's enemies, they break into laughter and pointing and joking. Jeremiah then asks God if if it's right for his people to be treated in this way, for his people to, to be littering, literally littering the streets with dead bodies. In fact, the hunger during the whole siege got so bad that Jeremiah says mothers ate their own children, which 
I agree with you, Jeremiah. That is a little too much. It's not supposed to be that way. And what can we learn from this whole thing? It turns out that Jeremiah's lamentations isn't the only lamentations that we find in the Bible. In fact, these songs of sorrow are littered right through the Bible. We find it everywhere. That's why there's a word for it, this word lament. This word means an, a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. You see, it's so much more than moaning or complaining. No, it, there is so much more to it in that it is purposeful, it is meaningful, and it has a reason every single time. So much so that 50 of the 150 Psalms, that's a third of the Psalms, are actually laments. They contain some sort of lament. Then there's the Book of Lamentations, which is kind of dedicated to this lament. And then there's Jesus. Now he laments the state of the world. Jesus laments the faithlessness of the people that he meets on a daily basis. And Jesus laments his torture be before going to the cross and being crucified. Now, a lament is not the same as a complaint. You see, it's natural for us to, to want to avoid pain, to want to avoid suffering, to want to avoid hurt, grief, and trauma. Although that's natural, it is unnatural for us to be able to avoid any of that. It is as normal as the sunset and the sunrise. It is as normal as the wind on our faces. In this world, in this life, we will face those terrible things. Otherwise, it won't be life as we know it, will it? Complaints do this. They state the issue. Then they reframe the pain. They rehearse the suffering and they replay the trauma and then restarts the cycle of stating the issue, reframing the pain, rehearsing the suffering, and replaying the trauma. And then it repeats the cycle. Can you see what happens there? It's kind of like we're, we're digging in a hole into not only our souls, but into the world, and it, it leads constantly to depression and hurt and anger. A lament is not despair. It's not just despair or not just crying. A lament is not just sorrow or expressing or venting, let's be honest, emotion. A lament is a form of prayer, which is so much more than all of that. You see, a lament brings the issue to God. It then tells the truth and paints a very real picture of what's going on. A lament talks to God about the pain, about the fear, about the frustration and, and the sorrow. And a lament over and over and over again shows that we trust God to have the answers to what we are facing. You see, when we act like, and we do act like, we have all the answers. Like, I can take care of any situation that I face. We, in fact, um, we commit an act of adul uh, not adultery, but idolatry. Uh, it is acting like we are God. Because, you see, when we act like we can do anything and everything for ourselves, then we think that we are God. But the truth is, if we really dig into whatever thing that we're digging into, we know that there are some things that is just bigger than us, bigger than our comprehension, bigger than our ability, bigger than our power. And see, so a lament comes and it helps us to relearn our humanity. You see, a lament admits that I don't have it all together. A lament admits that I need help. A lament admits that I need God in every day, in every situation. Now, if we could handle it all, if we could handle everything that life throws at us, then we would have no need of Jesus. We would have no need of his power. We would have no need of his forgiveness, his care, 
or his grace. We would have no need of the cross and we would have no need of his resurrection. But the truth is, uh, we do need that. We need it every single day of our lives. Lament is grieving, but it's grieving in a different way. It is grieving as those who have hope. Now, Psalm 13 is a wonderful example of a good lament. I want us to look at it and take four elements of a good lament from it and see what we can learn. Psalm 13 says the following. O Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes, or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat, saying, we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. As I said, Psalm 13 goes right into the psyche of the psalmist. He tells us that he has good reason to complain. There is some bad stuff that has happened to him. To him. But it takes a turn for the best at the end. Let's take a look at four elements to a good lament. The first is to turn to God. <laughs> you see, we naturally turn to social media, or Hello Peter, or a lawyer, or many of the other things that we turn to. I know you, if you're anything like me, you turn to the water cooler or the coffee pot. And you stand there until you have a victim, someone that you can complain to. And we all kind of have those people and we all kind of have those moments. You might even know that circle of people. You know those guys where, where there's only negativity and where there's only despair around them. And you know if you go there, you will find a sympathetic ear that will complain with you. In fact, if you've never been in a room and you stand kind of as an outsider looking in, you can see the little cloud of thunder and mist and lightning that follows these folks around. <laughs> so we all know about them. And I know the thunder and the lightning and everything is not really true. But we know these people. And sometimes we become these people. And that's dangerous for all of us. A good lament starts by turning to God. Turning to God, the one with the power and the resources to actually change the situation. The one who can actually rescue us from what we're facing. Psalm 34 and verse 17 says, The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from their troubles. The Bible has more than a hundred references like this, where people call out to God and he hears them. And he rescues them, he saves them, he helps them over and over and over again. And I want to say there's more than a thousand references in my life where I've turned to God. I've called out to him and he's come and he's rescued me. The second point or the second element of a good lament is to bring your complaint. Now, we pray and and lamentation is lamenting is a prayer but sometimes our prayer lives stink let's just be honest it contains bless me it contains keep me and it contains save me and then we run out of things to say you see this is where a lament is so different it humbly and honestly brings god our pain it brings our questions and it brings our frustrations it doesn't stray away from the truth. It doesn't shy away from the truth. And it paints the full picture of what we're facing. You see, this happens and then we hear ourselves saying it. And then it gets awkward and it gets uncomfortable. Because we don't like hearing ourselves saying these things out loud. But 
what happens is that our prayer lives become real and not just superficial. It means that we actually get deep into what it really is to speak to God. The next element of a good lament is to ask boldly for help. You see, when we seek God in our pain, it is actually one of the greatest acts of faith that we can ever commit. You see, when we ask God in faith, we actually have this quiet confidence in the background that we know that He is actually the one above all else and above all others who can help us in our situation and through our situation. Our silence, our complaints, and our denial, well, they create despair. And they, they go down that spiral that we spoke of earlier and lead us to depression. And what actually happens is that it becomes impossible to win the fights that this despair and this depression picks on a daily basis. It is the biggest bully that you will face in your whole life because depression and despair knows all your flaws and it acknowledges none of your strength. But, you see, a lament comes and it, it sees the bad and it lays out the bad, but then it looks to the place where there is hope and it injects hope into your situation and into my situation. In fact, a lament dares us to hope in God. It invites us into God's rich promises. And God keeps His rich promises. So, so far, we have turned to God. We have brought our complaint. And we have asked boldly for His help. The last element of a good lament is to choose to trust God. You see, all laments, all good laments, lead to trust. And trust enables us to navigate a broken world. Psalm 13 that we looked at as, a, as an example of a good lament, at the end of it, verses 5 and 6, it reads this. It says, But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because He is good to me. Now between verses 4 and 5, nothing changed. You see, David's still facing everything that he's facing. It, it still hurts. It still stinks. It's still hard. His enemies are still out to get him. But David's lament has turned him away from the situation and toward hope in God's rich promises. And that's why he can say, I will trust your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you will rescue me. And I will sing because you are good to me, O oh God. You see, although nothing has changed, David's perspective about everything has changed. Now, like I said, a good lament is our way to navigate through this broken world. We can't avoid the sorrow. We can't avoid the grief, the pain, the trauma that this world has for us, in store for us. But we, can't, we can deal with it. We can deal with it well. And to deal with it well, we need to turn to God. We need to move through it with Him. We need to move through it with Him onto the hope that He has for us, onto the future that He promises us over and over again in His Word. You see, so often we land up on the wrong end of a situation and we think, I don't have all the answers. And let's be honest, we will never have all the answers. So that's not a criteria to stress us out, is it? Then some of us go, maybe if I, I know all the scriptures, maybe if I take my Bible and I, I read through all of it and I get all of it into my head, I will have all the answers. But once again, even the people with all the Bible knowledge in the world don't have all the answers to the problems that we face in the world other than turn to God. Seek Him out and He will have a way forward for you. 
You see, to lament is one of the most theologically informed decisions that you and I will ever make. Why? Well, to know the problem, to call it by its name, and to turn it over to the one with the power and the resources to actually make a difference, that's just smart. That's math that just adds up, isn't it? Why are we telling you all this? Why are we going around this mountain so often? Well, it's so that we can be honest, so that we can be a little uncomfortable in this, so that we can be real when we speak to God, not to get something off of our chests, not for the sake of getting anything off of our chests, but actually for the sake of turning to God, the one who can help us, the one with the answers to our struggles and our situations. So what's your next step? I want to challenge you to go and write your own lament. And if need be, write seven. Don't expect it to turn into beautiful prose or poetry. We all stink at this initially. Don't think that it's going to turn into a popular song because I wouldn't want my lament to turn into anything other than uh, in the quiet of my bedroom between me and God. Let's just be honest about that. But I want to challenge you to take the steps to turn to God, to bring your complaint, to ask boldly for help, and to choose to trust Him. It's so simple. It's pray, be honest, ask and trust. And allow God to lead you through the brokenness on a process of healing, and at the end of it, to wholeness in every single situation that you face. Now, be honest with you, uh, your one lament will be quickly followed by a second lament because while we're facing the current situation, a next situation is probably developing in our worlds and in our lives. And God's not caught off guard by these things, although we are caught off guard by these things all the time. What's the point of all this? Well, we started by talking about lamentations. And I want to read you what Jeremiah wrote in the middle of his lamenting, in the middle of his complaining and moaning and just bringing the sorrow and hurt to God. He wrote this in Lamentations 3. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends, His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance and therefore I will hope in Him. This world is filled with tears and this world is filled with sorrows. May we be bold enough to turn those tears and sorrows over to God, the one who can actually make a difference. Let's pray together. I thank you, Lord, that you give us opportunities to walk out of our despair, to walk out of our troubled situations, to walk out of our brokenness, Father God. I thank you that you have the power to lend to us, to help us through these things, Lord. Lord, as we turn to you, as we ask for your help, I know that none of these prayers fall on deaf ears, Father God, but that you are actively working on our behalf to change us and our situations into what you have for us, into the best at every time, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that we can trust you, that you move us from our brokenness into this process of healing and onto the wholeness that you have for us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So go out there this week and take a chance. Go and lament. Take five minutes and moan a bit, but don't end there. Make sure that if your moan turns you toward God, man, it's a good lament. Have a wonderful week.